So today we're going to be learning about nerve signals and hopefully you've already done the lesson on the nervous system overall, looking at the different parts of the nervous system, looking at the uh, central nervous system, <clears throat> the peripheral nervous system, and mostly what you're going to need to know today is the neuron and the different parts of the neuron because today we're going to look at how those signals actually get passed between neurons. So if you look at the picture down here, uh, you'll see that this is the um, neuron here and uh, these are the dendrites and this is what receives the signal from the previous neuron. It comes here to the cell body and then it ends up going down the axon here. And so it follows here until it gets to the end of the axon and you can see it's now attaching itself to another uh, neuron here. Okay, so today we're going to talk about how those signals actually get passed from one neuron to the next. So, nerve signals uh, is a site where a neuron makes a connection with another neuron or an effector, and an effector could be anything that is looking to receive the signal, whether it's a muscle, whether it's a gland, things like that. Uh, that area is called a synapse. Okay, so the synapse is the site where that neuron makes that connection. So if you look down here at the picture, um, you can see that this is the end of the first neuron and this is the end of the second neuron. And there's always a little gap in between. They don't fully connect here in chemical, in, uh, chemical signals. Okay, so the electric signal gets sent down um, and then it has to make its way through this gap to the next neuron here. So it says nerve impulses must somehow get across the gap from one axon of one neuron Okay, and that one is called the presynaptic cell. Sorry, that's all one word. So the presynaptic cell is the one that is before. So here, this would be the presynaptic cell. And it has to get from the end of this presynaptic cell to the cell body of the next neuron, or the effector. So this could be then the next neuron that's going to pass a signal onto. It also could be a muscle or a gland or something that's going to actually receive that signal. And that second one that receives a signal is called the postsynaptic cell. Okay, and so communication across the synapse. In this case, this picture is actually showing a uh, chemical. Okay, so this is showing a chemical communication, but there's also an electrical communication that we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, so that connection can either happen chemically, oops, or it can happen electrically. So the first type is a chemical synapse, and the chemical synapse means that instead of being directly connected, there's always a gap in between the two neurons. And so this neuron here uh, and this neuron, there's a gap here, okay? And that gap, um, what it allows the neuron to do is it actually sends little chemicals, or what we call in the case of synapses, we call them neurotransmitters. Okay, so a neurotransmitter is released by the axon terminal. An axon terminal just means like the end of the axon here. So this axon terminal will send out a neurotransmitter uh, into this space here. And then it will attach to little receptors. The receptors are here, the little white things, um, that will then attach to these neurotransmitters and then the signal will get passed on. Okay, so plasma membranes of the pre- and postsynaptic cells are separated by a narrow gap. Okay, so this narrow gap here is actually called the synaptic cleft. Okay, so the synaptic cleft is the general area right here where there's a little gap. Okay, the other way that communication can be made is through something called an electrical synapse, and that's what we're dealing with down here. So the plasma membrane, meaning the plasma membrane, um, this membrane right here, and this membrane right here of the two neurons, so the presynaptic means the one that the signal is coming from, and the postsynaptic, the one that the signal is going to, they are in direct contact. Okay, so they actually physically touch each other. Whereas the other ones, there was, oops, there was a uh, gap in between them here. In this case, they're in direct contact. Uh, 
and what that does is it allows the current to flow directly from one neuron to the next and you can imagine that that, that allows for very rapid transmission of the signal. Okay, so that signal is going to get passed very quickly through because they don't have to first send out a signal, send out the chemicals, wait for it to attach to the receptors, and then send it on. So these happen very, very fast. The majority of what we're going to talk about today, though, are our chemical synapses because that's what the majority of our neurons use uh, for what we need to talk about in this course. So now we're going to discuss how the electrical signals actually get conducted. So how do they get from one end of the neuron to the next neuron? So first we need to discuss the resting membrane. So at rest, when the neurons are just hanging out, uh, what's going on with them? Okay, so this is the neuron here, and they call this the plasma membrane. That's the same thing as saying a cell membrane. It just means the part of the neuron here, um, we're just looking at here, and the inside and the outside of the neuron. Okay, so in all animal cells, the outside of the nerve, uh, or they call it extracellular, is always going to be positive at rest. Okay, so you can look over here and you can see that the positive are on the outside here. And inside of the nerve cell or inside the cytoplasm is going to be negative. Okay, so we've got over here, um, you've got the inside here negative and the outside is positive. And there is a charge separation that has to do with differing ion concentration. So if you remember uh, from earlier when we talked about ions, Ions are just any molecule that has lost or gained an electron, okay? So the ion uh, specifically that we're going to be talking about a lot is sodium and potassium, okay? So those are both ions uh, that in these cases have lost electrons because they are positive, okay? So the difference in concentrations between those ions, either outside of the cell or inside of the cell, is what causes this charge separation. So if there's a lot of positive things outside, the outside is going to be more positive. If there's fewer positive things, ions on the inside, then they're going to be more negative inside. Okay, so the charge separation, um, specifically the differing ion concentrations that we're dealing with, in this case is Na and K. And you should put the little plus sign uh, beside both of them like I did here on your notes. It's just difficult for me to type. Okay, so the charge separation <coughs> excuse me, is due to differing ion concentrations um, of sodium and potassium on the inside and outside of the membrane. And what this charge separation does is it creates a potential difference. And if you remember back to grade 9, uh, when we insisted on calling voltage potential difference, that's why. Because we wanted to discuss where the different concentrations of positives were and negatives were that cause that potential difference. Because remember, our body likes to be in homeostasis. We don't like to have differing things in different areas. Okay, And so what we call this, that potential difference across the membrane, is called membrane potential. Okay, And so our membrane, in this case, has potential to do work. And it has potential to do work because of the differing ion concentrations. If we have lots of positives outside, not a lot of positive insides, you can imagine what's going to want to happen. The cell is going to want to even out those concentrations, and that's why we say it has potential. So any charge, sorry, any cell with a separation of charge, so we've got positives on one side, negative on the, on the other side, <coughs> is said to be what we call polarized. Okay, and so the polarized cell here, oops, sorry about that, uh, the polarized cell here because you've got a charge separation of positives and negatives there. And the normal resting potential, so everything we go when we talk about voltage and we talk about potential difference, we always talk about charges. So in this case, we're going to be looking at, um, we're looking at it in terms of millivolts. Whereas in grade 9, we just kind of talked a lot about volts, but in this case, the uh, voltage is small enough that we're going to use millivolts. And so the normal resting membrane potential of the cell membrane is minus 70 millivolts. And that is going to be what you put right there. So at negative 70 millivolts, that's the resting membrane potential. So if you look over here, sorry, I know I'm screwing up your diagram here. 
Uh, if you look at the diagram over here, this is resting membrane potential. So right now it's at negative 70 millivolts, and that's just at rest. So you can see that you've got your, this is your membrane here. Okay, so you can see your phospholipid bilayer, and these are ion channels. And these are channels that allow either potassium or, I'm just going to get rid of this so it's out of your way. Okay, so this is the channels for both um, sodium and for potassium. And right now they are both closed. So at rest, um, there is no movement of potassium or sodium. Everything's just where it is. But because it is a negative signal, that means we're going to have more negatives on the inside of our cell and more positives on the outside. So overall, we're at a charge difference of negative 70 millivolts. So that's just at rest. Okay, so the first stage is when the neuron first conducts an electrical impulse, meaning it's received some sort of signal either from the brain or from a muscle that's coming back to your central nervous system. So there's some sort of electrical impulse that the neuron has received, and there's going to end up being a change in the membrane potential. Okay, so if you remember, it was positive on the outside, negative on the inside. When we start to change that membrane potential, that number of negative 70 millivolts is going to change, we call that an action potential. So that action potential is going to end up looking kind of like a graph that you're going to see at the end. Um, we're going to go through each step now. So the first thing is going to be excitation. So during excitation, meaning, oops, excite. so during excitation, okay, that means that the neuron is starting to get excited. Okay, and the neuron is getting excited because that electrical impulse has shown. Okay, and in order for excitation to happen, there's something called a threshold. And this threshold here is approximately is negative 55 millivolts. Okay, so the if we look at the picture over here. Okay, right over here, you can see that the negative 70 was at rest, and there's something called a threshold, and that's that line right here. So if the signal's not strong enough to reach negative 55 millivolts, then that means that the action potential won't happen. Okay, so it's once it gets to that point, it's going to fire, but it has to get to that level before it will fire at all. Okay, so it has to be at least excited enough to get to negative 55 millivolts. Okay, so during excitation, it has to reach a threshold of approximately negative 55 millivolts. The neuron membrane becomes more permeable to sodium ions. Okay, so the sodium ions are over here in the purple, and what will happen is that the membrane itself will become more permeable to sodium ions. So what's going to happen is that sodium ions rush into cell. So once these once these gates here open up, um, then the sodium ions are going to want to rush in. And they want to rush in for a couple of reasons. Okay, The fact that there's more sodium outside of the cell, so remember outside of the cell here was positive. So because it was positive, that means there was a lot of sodium out here. And if there's a lot of sodium outside of the cell, remember natural diffusion is going to say that it's going to want to go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So those sodiums are all going to want to rush into the cell in order to even out those concentrations. Okay. Also, the inside of the membrane is more negative. So if you remember before, uh, we said that the outside of the cell here was very positive, and the inside of the cell was very negative. Okay. So naturally, when the there's lots of positives here and there's lots of negatives. You remember back to grade nine, we talked about how opposite charges attract. And so all of these positive charges are gonna to wanna to go towards the negative charges. Okay, so there's a couple reasons why the sodium ions are gonna rush in, but they do. So they rush in and what ends up happening is that you have a rapid inflow of sodium and it causes a charge reversal. Okay, so before we had positives on the outside, negatives on the inside. Well, when all the sodium starts to rush in, we actually end up switching the charges. And you end up having more positives inside and more negatives outside. Okay, and this is called 
depolarization. Okay, that's an important term. So depolarization means that when this neuron first gets excited, the electrical impulse is coming, the sodium channels open up, sodium starts to rush in, and you end up flipping the charges. Okay, so now you end up with having more negatives outside and more positives on the inside. So once the voltage inside the nerve cell becomes positive, So once the voltage inside here, once it becomes positive, okay, so we're going to switch our charges here, so the inside now is positive, when that happens, the sodium gates are going to close, okay, so sodium gates close, sodium gates close and the inflow of sodium stops, so sodium is going to stop at that point. So if we look at the diagram over here, Okay, so before we had, remember, positives on the outside, negatives on the inside, so meaning the inside of the cell was more negative. We were at resting of a negative 70 millivolts. Well, once those charges start to reverse, because all the sodium's coming in, you can see that our graph starts to climb here. Okay, so we've reached the threshold of negative 55, and we're on our way up to a positive number. Okay, so the charges on the inside have switched. So we were negative, and now we're becoming more positive. So now we're on to stage three. Step one was excitation, it receives the initial signal. Step two was depolarization, and now we are going to talk about repolarization. So once a neuron cell membrane has depolarized, okay, so remember depolarized meant that the charges have switched, there's a charge reversal, and it's passed on the signal, it needs to repolarize, oops, repolarize before it can transmit another signal. Okay, so it has to go back to its original state before it can pass on another signal. It can't stay in the state where it's going to have more positives on the inside and more negatives on the outside. So what needs to happen then is it needs to open the potassium channels. And so it has to open these potassium channels in the membrane. And if you look over here, the potassium channels here are in orange. So it has to open those channels. So remember, the sodium channels have closed once we got to depolarization, and now these sodium channels open, okay? And those will open at, the repolarization will occur at about negative 30 millivolts, okay? So we get to um, approximately about here, and that's when the sodium channels close and the potassium channels start to open. And what happens is that the potassium is going to diffuse out of the cell. Okay, and so once the potassium diffuses out of the cell, the positive charge then is leaving the cell, right? Because we had a whole bunch of positives in here because all of the sodium, yes, all the sodium came in here and we already had um, some potassium in here as well. So once these channels open, then potassium is going to start to leave the cell because we have too much positives inside the cell. We had all the positives um, from the potassium, and when now we added all those sodiums, there's too much positive in there. So when they have a whole bunch of positive, they want to get away from each other, they repel each other, and so the potassium ends up repelling the sodium, and they're going to want to leave the cell. So then what happens is that the inside of the cell becomes much more negative again. So once these potassium channels start to open, then the positive is going to start to leave, and then the inside of the cell gets negative again, which is what the cell wants to be in. So this is what's happening right here, okay? So all those potassium channels have opened, okay? So we were at resting, we got, we hit the membrane threshold, uh, we ended up getting up to about uh, 35 or 40 millivolts, and that is right here, so at about 30 millivolts here, this is where we're going to get before repolarization is going to start. So it allows it to get all the way up to here, it becomes really positive on the inside, and then eventually it's going to start to repolarize because it doesn't want to stay in that positive state. So potassium diffuses out of the cell and then the inside becomes negative again. And as always, our resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts. Okay, so once it gets, oh, I just did double millivolt, sorry about that.
So negative 70, once it gets to that negative 70 millivolt, millivolts, then it's happy, and that's when repolarization oops, is complete. Once repolarization is complete, we're back down to that resting membrane potential. Okay, so far we have uh, done one, and that's when it receives the stimulus, and we're at resting here at negative 70 millivolts. It has to get up to the threshold potential before this is going to go. So sometimes you'll see graphs where they kind of like drop off here, and that just means the stimulus wasn't strong enough to actually create an action potential. So we've done step one, that's excitation. Two is when the sodium channels open and sodium starts to rush into the cell, that's depolarization. And we get all the way up to about plus 30 millivolts, and that's when the sodium channels have closed and now the potassium channels open because we need to reverse those charges again. We need to get back to the original state, uh, which is called repolarization. So it's going to repolarize that area so that we end up with positives on the outside and negatives on the inside. And so we've done all the way up to step five. And you can see here what happens is that we start to dip down. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. So the potassium channels actually close rather slowly. So they don't close, they don't snap shut as quickly as the sodium ones do. So because they close slowly, uh, what happens is that uh, more potassium leaves, more potassium leaves the inside of the cell than is necessary to repolarize the cell back to the resting membrane potential. So all that means is when we get down to this point, instead of just stopping at negative 70 where we want to be at that resting membrane potential, because the sodium channels close kind of slowly, what happens is that more potassium leaves than is necessary. And so you get this little dip down here because we've actually pushed so much potassium outside of the cell uh, that we've actually gone below negative 70. And that extra potassium is leaving. And what it does is it, we call it hyperpolarizes it hyperpolarizes the cell, okay? And so we call that stage hyperpolarization uh, because it goes too polar, it gets too far into the negative. Okay, so what it does is it makes it more negative than it needs to be, okay? And so in all of your action potentials, you'll see it kind of start at negative 70, get up here to around 30 or 40 uh, millivolts positive, then we get back down in the negatives, but it actually goes below resting and then finally catches back up and gets back to resting. Okay, so that fifth stage then is called hyperpolarization. So after hyperpolarization, how do we get that resting membrane potential back? Because remember, it started up, went down, and then kind of dipped down. And so how do we get it back to that resting membrane potential? Well, that is done by something called the sodium potassium pump. So the sodium potassium pump is what does this. And the sodium potassium pump you can see right over here. Uh, and what it does, it is, a, it is a major contributor to the resting membrane potential. So remember the, oops, oh, sorry. The resting membrane potential has to be restored before it can receive and transmit another signal. So we need to get it back down to that minus 70, um, and the sodium potassium pump is what does that. So what it does is it uses active transport, and hopefully you remember from grade 11, active transport has to do with, um, it requires energy. And so you can see over here we're using ATP to drive this process. So this pump doesn't work without um, energy, and also because we're trying to pump sodium into an area where there's already a lot of sodium. Okay, and so we're going from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration, and that's what you can see over here in this diagram. So we're saying it's going, sodium is going from a lower concentration to where there's more of it, and so it requires energy to do that. And same thing over here, this potassium, uh, there's a lower amount of potassium outside of the cell, and so we need to pump it inside of the cell where there's already a higher concentration. So again, that requires energy. So we use active transport, um, and what we're going to do is we're going to pump sodium outside of the cell. Okay, so we're going to get sodium over here. Sodium we're going to get to leave the cell and we're going to end up with that outside. And we are going to pump potassium into the cell. Okay, so the potassium needs to go in. 
sorry about that, potassium needs to go in the cell and sodium needs to go outside of the cell. And so, as I mentioned before, sodium potassium pumps are powered by the hydrolysis of ATP, so we break down ATP, that breaking that bond, we end up with ADP and an inorganic phosphate, um, and what that does is it releases energy for this pump to work. So what it does is it pumps three sodium out of the cell, and it pumps two, oops, two potassium into the cell. Okay, so over here we're going to take the sodium, we're going to pump three out, and for every three that come out, two potassium come inside. And so you can imagine that if we're pumping three in this way and only two in this way, that we're going to end up with a positive charge on the outside and a negative charge on the inside, which is the resting membrane potential. That's what we need, right? There was a whole bunch of positives out here and the inside was negative. So that's how we're going to re-establish uh, that membrane potential. Okay, and as I mentioned before, it is active transport uh, because the molecules are being moved from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. So because there is already a lot of potassium out here and there's not a lot in here, it requires energy to pump those in and it requires energy to pump those out. So as the sodium and potassium, we call them gradients. So as the potassium and sodium gradients, meaning the concentration gradients. So over here, this is the concentration gradient. We have low here, we have high here. So once those potassium, uh, sodium and potassium gradients are restored, so once those gradients are restored, the membrane voltage returns to the resting membrane potential. And hopefully I'm boring this enough into your brain that you know that the resting membrane potential now is negative 70 millivolts. Okay, so this diagram here uh, is just kind of showing you that in more detail. So this is the membrane and you can see that, remember these things don't just happen once, we have many of them along our pathway here. So this would be um, the first one and it's pumping the three potassium in, or sorry, the three sodium in and the three potassium are going in this way. Okay, and so those are just happening over many different um, parts of the membrane. So as I said before, the conducting neurons cannot be activated, meaning the neuron can't be used again until the resting membrane potential is restored. And hopefully you remember at this point, everybody say it with me, the resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts. So we have to get back to that negative 70 millivolts before we can then pass on another action potential. So the time required for a depolarized nerve to repolarize, remember getting back to this resting membrane potential, is the called the refractory period. And the refractory period takes about 1 to 10 milliseconds. So it's obviously very quick, but we want that to be quick because if our neurons were lagging or taking time, we wouldn't be able to get the signals where we need them. Okay, so it doesn't take very long for that to happen, uh, but we do require that to happen before we can pass on another signal. So if you look at the diagram over here, um, this is all that's showing. So we've got this part of the nerve here is going through the current action potential. So you can see that the charges here have been switched, that it used to be positive on the outside, negative on the inside. These have been switched because it's allowed the sodium to get in and the potassium to get out. So those charges have swapped, um, and all it's saying is that we need to get that potential, so the nerve impulse is going this way. This one has already refracted, it's already switched back. We've got the positives on the outside, negatives on the inside. Repolarized area has recovered to that negative 70 millivolts. Uh, this one is currently going through the action potential, and it's passing the signal onto this one. And so eventually this resting membrane will end up looking like this action potential, and then that area will have to repolarize like it has over here. So overall, this is what an action potential looks like. So this is what we've been talking about already. The resting member potential here is negative 70. Uh, we need to hit that threshold. So this step one is the excitement period. So it's receiving an impulse of some kind. Has to be a strong enough signal for it to hit this threshold. If it does, um, then the sodium gates have opened 
and this is when we get through the depolarization stage. So we get up anywhere between you know 30 and 40 millivolts, and then what happens is the potassium gates have opened and the sodium gates have closed. And so when that happens, now we're getting a repolarization. So here the charges have switched. We now have more negative on the outside and more positive on the inside here. And then repolarization has to happen. It needs to restore that membrane potential that we need. So this is when the potassium gates have opened, sodium channels have closed. We go into repolarization. It's going to hit our resting membrane potential but remember, we're going to go through this slight dip of hyperpolarization because the potassium channels have closed rather slowly and more potassium has left than needed. Okay, so then we restore that membrane potential again, that resting membrane potential, by use of the sodium potassium pump. So this diagram over here is just kind of looking at the same thing. You can see that at negative 70, we've received a stimulus, we've received a message from our effector, which is a gland or a muscle or our. Um, brain is trying to send a message to an effector. So we receive that stimulus, we've hit the threshold, the sodium gates have opened, you can see the potassium gates have, are closed, that's when we get into depolarization. Once we hit um, a certain point, the sodium gates are going to close, and the potassium gates are still closed here, they open once that we start to go into negative here. So once those potassium gates open, that's when this starts to take a downturn and we're going to go back towards the negative. So we're restoring that negatives on the inside of the neuron. So we are repolarizing the membrane. Uh, we get down past the resting membrane potential uh, because of those sodium channel, or sorry, the potassium channels uh, that close slowly. And so more potassium ended up um, going than needed to. And so we need the sodium potassium pump to get us back to that rest membrane potential. So I've discussed this a few times but um, there's an important term that I want to make sure that we remember. So the strength of stimulus must reach what we call the threshold and the threshold is that minimum level of potential difference that it has to reach for an action potential to actually happen. Okay and I apologize um, because the negative did not follow the number but I, this is a negative 55 millivolts. Okay, so if you look over here, the negative kind of stayed on the wrong line. So just make sure you make note of that. So it's a negative 55. So it has to reach around a negative 55 millivolts before the nerve will fire an impulse. Otherwise, the action potential um, will not fire. Okay, so below this threshold, the nerve will not fire at all, meaning it won't pass on that signal to the next neuron. When the nerve does fire, it does so maximally. There's no such thing as half a neuron transmission. Okay, so there's no weak neuron transmission, there's no strong one, okay? Strength is not dependent on um, how much the neuron is passing on the action potential. If it's going to fire, it does so maximally. So if it hits the threshold, it's going to go just as fast and just as strong as it would at any other potential, okay? And that is called the all or none principle. Okay, so the all or none principle just means you either have a response or you don't. You're not going to have a weak one, you're not going to have a specifically strong one. Um, it just means you either have it or you don't if it's going to re if it reaches that threshold here. Now, the more intense a stimulus, so for example, if you happen to put your hand on a hot element, that's a more intense stimulus. So that message is going to be coming back to you quickly. Um, it's not necessarily going to be a stronger impulse, but you're actually going to get more impulses actually happening. So you're going to get more frequency of impulses. So those um, axons and those neurons will be sending more and more and more and more and more messages um, to tell your brain that the thing that you are touching is very hot and you need to deal with that. Okay, so it's not necessarily the strength of the impulse, but actually going to send more of them. So for instance, if you're touching um, you know, a hot element versus a warm element, you might cause three or four neurons to fire instead of just one with a warm one. So that's it for nerve signals. Uh, you should have, a, again, a good overview of the nervous system in general, what parts make up the nervous system, the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, um, all those things from the lesson from this week. And now we went through how those neurons actually pass signals from one to the next, so it can actually get from your muscle to your brain and then back to your muscle again. Um, and so if you have any questions about that, please let me know.
Um, I've put a couple videos up on OneNote as well. Please have a look at those. Again, it's always nice to have visuals and it's nice to hear a voice other than my own. So please have a look at those. Um, email me if you have any questions. I'm also going to do another video for synaptic transmission, so how those neurotransmitters actually get sent from one neuron to the next, and uh, then we will be wrapping up the nervous system. So let me know if you have any questions, and uh, hopefully I'll see you all on Monday. Bye!